in Sweden, and I'll be the chair of this session. So we have two talks, and the first one is by um, Piotr Magierski, and he will talk about solitonic excitations and collisions of superfluid nuclei. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, and also I apologize for this shift of my talk uh, till afternoon. But it happened that my luggage actually was arrived today in the morning, so I couldn't work on my talk and adjust it yesterday, so uh, I needed more time uh, to prepare uh, this presentation, so that mainly to introduce you to the, to the subject. So I understand that you are not familiar, well, most of you are not familiar with nuclear physics, so uh, I will be showing also some general slides concerning uh, uh, atomic nuclei. Uh, so this is, uh, so this talk is on the uh, specific effect uh, that we think may happen during the collision of uh, superfluid nuclei. And, uh, but this is uh, only a part of the project uh, that is being developed for already more than almost 10 years, I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the project that aims at uh, the description of uh, superfluid Fermi systems far from equilibrium. So uh, uh, this is the project that is done in collaboration between Warsaw University of Technology and uh, there are people in US, um, main uh, collaborator is Aurel Bulgak, although in this particular, this particular study, uh, this only these two people were involved. So actually, uh, uh, concerning this project, there will be two more talks on Friday. Actually, Gabriel will be talking about uh, application uh, uh, of this method that we are using to ultra-cold atomic gases. And uh, also on Friday, uh, Aurel Bulgak will be talking about induced nuclear fission. So, uh, so uh, everything that I'm saying will be also applicable to their talks. Uh, so uh, if you are interested, I strongly encourage to, uh, to attend these two talks. They will be given by Skype. So, uh, <coughs> so our goal is uh, so our goal is to describe the superfluid dynamics of fermionic systems far from equilibrium uh, using the microscopic framework. And uh, in this case, microscopic means that we would like to treat explicitly fermionic degrees of freedom. Uh, and for that purpose, we use the density functional theory, time-dependent density, uh, time density functional theory, which is extended to superfluid systems. Uh, <coughs> the reason is that we, we are interested in uh, systems that are spatially inhomogeneous and we would like to perturb these systems using some external probes, uh, usually. So the framework of time-dependent density functional theory seems to be the best for this purpose. And this is uh, still quite computationally demanding approach, especially when we would like uh, to study superfluid systems. Uh, so at the moment, uh, the limitations concerning the number of fermions that we can actually simulate, that we can evolve in time, is due to the uh, limitation of the current supercomputers. And at the moment, we can evolve like hundreds of thousands of superfluid fermions. So this is the limit at the moment. Uh, so let me remind you some basic uh, some basic theorems concerning density functional. So this is supposed to be an approach that is exact in a sense that uh, there is uh, the theorem that says that 
the uh, information about the evolution of, the, of your exact many body wave function uh, under, under condition that, you, that the continued equation is fulfilled. This actually can be, uh, can be uh, coded into the one body, uh, one body density up to the some arbitrary constant. So this is a theorem which is not extremely useful for us because we don't know how to, how to, uh, how to construct the density, uh, energy density functional. This, this has to be taken from somewhere else. So it's different density functional when we, st for studies of nuclear system, different density functional uh, for studies of ultra cold atomic systems. Uh, but still it gives you some uh, some blessing for your uh, uh, for your th for theoretical effort uh, which says that in principle we should be able to describe the system well maybe not exactly but as as uh, accurately as our density functional allows us so the usual treatment uh, is to replace the uh, full many body Schrodinger equation by the equivalent uh, equations for the non interacting fictitious non interacting fermi systems and uh, and this substitution is performed under condition that the density calculated using this many body uh, wave function is the same as the density calculated uh, for this uh, function phi, which is Slater determinant. Uh, this, uh, actually, this approach has some limitations, and the limitations, for example, are the following. So no dissipation effects, except for so-called one-body dissipation, are taken into account here, which is justified if the energies that we are interested in are not too large. And another thing is that uh, we can reliably calculate only one body observables. Of course, the extensions are possible. And uh, you heard, for example, in the morning, the extension based on stochastic TD uh, time-dependent Hartree-Fock, which allows you to calculate al also two body densities, three body densities, and also uh, take into account the dissipation effects. But this is the but extension to the stochastic time-dependent Hartree-Fock is introduces another level of complexity. So this is not something that we can uh, that we can do for a real system that we are interested in actually at the moment. Uh, so uh, so let me say a few words about extension of uh, this approach to. Uh, uh, superfluid system. So this was, uh, as uh, you may know, it, it uh, in uh, in the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, uh, these papers uh, uh, where the density functional theory has been extended to superfluid systems has been formulated. It was mainly triggered by the discovery of high TC superconductors. The problem is that uh, uh, the the pairing the pairing field or the pairing gap is here non-local and is defined as a, a functional derivative of the density functional with respect to the anomalous uh, density. Uh, this is a serious limitation uh, um, due to the fact that if we would like to study time-dependent problems using this object, that would uh, the equivalent of solving integral differential equations, which w is of enormous complexity. So we would rather like to uh, do everything in the local approximation. So we instead would like to introduce the local pairing field. And this can be done, actually. This can be done so the local, fer the local pairing field can be introduced. The only problem here is that if you do that, you will find out that actually your uh, your pairing energy is uh, is divergent. 
So if you, uh, you, uh, if you sum the contribution from all states, you will get a divergent expressions. But uh, actually, this divergence cancels with the divergence coming from the kinetic energy. So you can actually regularize, regularize your, uh, your theory, introducing some effective coupling constant and uh, keeping the same energy cutoff for both kinetic term and the pairing term. Uh, so uh, so we, within this local, uh, so this time-dependent density functional uh, uh, theory equations with the local pairing field, they look like this. So they, they, uh, they resemble the bogolyubov degen equations or in nuclear physics we call them time-dependent hartree bogolyubov equations. So uh, uh, the main feature here is that you have the pairing field that, that appear here and, uh, and uh, this dynamics of the pairing field is actually what is crucial for the description of uh, the effect that I will be talking about, but also other effects in ultra-cold atomic gases uh, and in uh, nuclear systems. So uh, this problem is already quite computationally demanding because uh, the number of equations, the number of equations that you need to, that you need to uh, solve is uh, dictated by the size of the lattice. So we solve it, so we solve this equation on the lattice, spatial lattice. And for example, if we take the lattice 64 cube, so that means that we have like quarter million of this of these equations that we need to evolve. So this is not something that you can uh, uh, solve on the laptop. So uh, we need uh, supercomputers and we actually benefit a lot from these supercomputers that have hybrid GPU, CPU architecture because it turns out that if we use GPU, the we get enormous speed up of our codes. It's a factor. Uh, so it's uh, it's really a lot. Uh, okay, so uh, so these are machines that we are using. This is not just to impress you with the supercomputers. It's just to tell you that actually there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, a lot of tricks that we use to to translate these equations to be efficiently to be efficiently, that can be efficiently run on the supercomputers. That's, this, is, this is really not straightforward thing and we benefit from collaboration with computer scientists that uh, uh, helped us to use these machines efficiently. Uh, so, uh, so we use this machinery to study uh, for three fields of interest. So one is uh, nuclear physics, low energy nuclear physics, and this is what I will be talking about. And also uh, uh, our talk on Friday will be devoted to fission. Also uh, we apply it to, uh, uh, to neutron star. So we would like to model, we are modeling the interior of the neutron star. This is the physics of neutron star. S is, uh, uh, actually quite uh, uh, rapidly developing right now due to after the detection of gravitational waves people are studying the neutron star mergers and, uh, uh, and this is very hot topic actually at the moment. So another uh, field is the ultra cold atomic uh, gases uh, and uh, all these systems at low temperatures are superfluid. The difference is that uh, uh, they have a different strength of the pairing correlations. So the weakest pairing correlations actually are in nuclear systems. So it, you can measure them as a ratio of the pairing gap to the Fermi energy. So it tells you that the pairing gap is here pretty small and the size of the Cooper pair is actually quite large. So the size of the Cooper pair in nuclear system is of the order of the size of a nucleus. Whereas on the other hand here, the the pairing is uh, the pairing gap is uh, much larger, and the size of the Cooper pair is comparable to the interparticle uh, uh, interparticle distance 
in ultra cold atomic gases. Okay, so now uh, let me show you what we know about pairing in nuclear systems. So this is uh, uh, this is the slide with the not very new, but it was not uh, uh, no substantial change recently. So this is these are various calculations of the pairing gap as a function of the the Fermi momentum, which is which can be translated as to the uh, to the density. So this is the how the pairing gap behave in the infinite neutron matter uh, uh, as a function of the density. So uh, if you take simply uh, your nucleon-nucleon interaction and plug it to the BCS equation, you get this curve, so this green curve. And uh, but then uh, there are various contributions coming from the from the polarization of the medium. So uh, you have to take into account this correction, and this is very complicated thing. And there are various approaches, and you can see these approaches differ. So uh, what we know about what we know about pairing up is that for nuclear system, which is on this uh, density scale, is atomic nuclei are somewhere here. So this atomic so the so the pairing up in atomic nuclei is of the order of one MeV. Okay, so this is this is the energy scale. Uh, of course, you can you can experimentally extract the pairing gap. Uh, by subtracting the difference in masses of odd and even nuclei. But this is not a perfect measure because nuclei, when you change the number of particles, they also change the formation. So when you experimentally try to extract the pairing up from odd even mass differences, you also take into account the effect of, for example, changing the deformation of a nucleus. Well, the common uh, uh, the common knowledge in nuclear physics is that the pairing up is of the order of one MeV. Of course, for some nuclei, like magic nuclei, it disappears completely. On so so pairing uh, so pairing field is very weak for nuclear system, but it's very important. It's important in a sense that there are countless examples of phenomena in the low energy nuclear physics. It cannot be explained without including the pairing correlations. And actually, the pairing correlations are extremely important for uh, uh, large amplitude collective motion of nuclei. For example, one of the examples is the induced fission. So this is the example of induced fission uh, of plutonium-240. So this is the... Uh, uh, shape of the uh, plutonium 240 after emission of the after absorption of neutron uh, and uh, it's already kind of elongated and uh, uh, now let me okay Okay, so this is the uh, uh, this is how the uh, nucleus fissions. And the interesting thing is that if you switch off the pairing correlation in the system, the nucleus will never fission. Okay. So it fissions actually only due to the due to the appearance of pairing correlation in the system. So the pairing correlations acts like a kind of a lubricant that that uh, uh, makes this large amplitude collective uh, motion easier okay, okay so let me now uh, turn to the main uh, 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 main uh, main topic of this uh, presentation. So, this what is this solitonic excitation nuclear collisions? 
So uh, uh, we simply uh, wanted to study the collision of two superfluid nuclei, which uh, have a different phases of the pairing field. So pairing field is described by the it's a complex field, so it can have a so two nuclei can have in principle different can uh, have a different phases of the pairing field. So this is something this is uh, something that was uh, we were actually inspired by experiments in ultra-cold atomic gases where people were merging two lithium-6 uh, clouds where they changed the phase, so this is the, so this is the, uh, this is the cloud, they, uh, they, they uh, uh, shine the light on the part of the cloud and change the phase of the pairing field in this part with respect to this part and they merge it. And what they see is, uh, what they reported is the appearance of the heavy soliton. So this is, so this is the picture here. So this is this structure, this dark structure here that is bouncing back and forth in this trap. So, uh, <coughs> uh, so this actually, uh, uh, so what is this heavy soliton? So it turns out later that it's not heavy soliton. It's actually vortex ring. Uh, so later they published another paper. Uh, these authors published another paper showing that this was actually vortex ring, and this vortex ring, uh, which is uh, here uh, denoted by this red, red circle, and this vortex ring evolves, and there is a whole cascade how this vortex ring evolves. And nice thing is that using our approach, we could actually reproduce this uh, uh, decay pattern of this initial vortex ring. Uh, so, uh, okay, so then we asked ourselves the question, what could be the, what could be the uh, analog of this effect in nuclear systems? So, of course, in nuclear systems, we do not expect that we will have a vortex ring inside a nucleus because the system is too small, but uh, uh, there could be some other observable effects. Uh, we can collide nuclei which differ by different, which have a different phase of the pairing field, and we can measure kinetic energies of the fragments, capture cross section, and see whether this effect somehow manifests itself in these uh, quantities that can be observed experimentally. Of course, in nuclear experiments, contrary to atomic gas, to atomic gases, we cannot control the phase of the pairing field, so we don't have a such a device that can allow us to change the, the phase of the pairing field in one nucleus with respect to the, to, to the other. So we have to, after, so we ha so after, the, uh, after the collisions, we have to average over all possible phase differences and see whether such an effect can survive after such an averaging. Okay, so uh, 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 how much time do I have? Okay, so maybe I will skip this uh, kind of uh, pedagogical slides and uh, uh, let me estimate what could be the mag what 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 will be the magnitude of the effect. So at first, uh, actually, you may think that the magnitude of the effect is dictated by this quantity, which is the condensation energy. So this is the pairing energy. Uh, which is in, if you substitute here the quantities characteristic for nuclear system, you will find out that this quantity is of the order of MeV. So, of, uh, so this is quite not, not very large quantity. Uh, uh, so uh, then it's, uh, it's questionable whether such an energy difference can be actually detected in, uh, in experiment. But on the other hand, if you think uh, what, what will be the energy uh, stored in a junction of two superfluids that you attach together and have a different phases. And then you estimate this energy uh, th that is stored in this junction. So this, uh, so this energy is actually depending on the sine square of the phase difference. But the factor here, if you substitute here the numbers characteristic for nuclear system, you'll find out that this is 
of order of magnitude larger. So this is 30 MeV, and this is already, and this is, and this is a quantity that uh, can be detected in experiment. So uh, how it is? Okay. So 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 now we can. Uh, uh, use uh, our method and see what will what will happen in the in the in the in the collision of two uh, nuclei. So we chose at first two very heavy nuclei, so plutonium 240, uh, that are collided at the energy which is right above the Coulomb barrier. So you know that nuclei are positively charged. So to uh, to join them, you have to overcome the Coulomb barrier. Uh, so if you just uh, use the energy right above the Coulomb barrier, this is what will happen. So let me explain what is on this figure. So th these are these density distributions of plutonium. Here are the here are the uh, uh, here are the pairing fields. So the absolute values of the of the neutron of the neutron pairing gap. So these are shown here, and these are different phase different phase differences between these two these two objects. So here are no phase difference between these two and here is the maximum phase difference which is equal to pi. Okay, and then uh, okay. I have done it. And look here, what is happening here. So you s clearly see that the pairing actually is vanishing, is going to zero uh, in the junction between these two nuclei. And this is and this is due to the fact that the phase here is uh, that the phase between these two fragments is very different. So uh, b by uh, uh, so from this collision, you do not see you do not see uh, uh, anything anything strange. But then if you but then if you calculate, if we calculate the kinetic energy of the fragments after the separation of these plutoniums as a function of the phase difference, you will clearly see that this kinetic energies depends on the phase difference and is and is dependence exactly this phi sine sine square of the phase difference okay so it's exactly uh, the kinetic energies uh, the kinetic energies carries the information about this energy that is stored in the junction between these two colliding colliding nuclei uh, so uh, so maybe this one. You know also that if there is a phase difference between these two nuclei, so there is also the possi possibility for some for some uh, nucleon transfer from one nucleus to the other, so like in the Josephson effect. So uh, actually, this is this is actually the number of neutrons and the number of protons that were transferred, uh, but this is not a significant uh, significant quantity. The interesting thing is that. Uh, this effect can modify the capture cross section of the medium nuclei because now if you go uh, if you study the uh, lighter nuclei which can actually join and stay together then uh, this phase difference uh, depending on this phase difference you can have either they can stay together or they can separate So this is a, a, again a density distribution and the pairing fields, and then you see that here, when the pairing, when the phase difference, phase difference were maximum, they were separated. Whereas here, when the phase difference was zero, they stayed together. Okay. So that means that there is a contribution 
that, that there will be a con that there will be a modification of the capture cross section, and uh, uh, and possibly it can be experimentally detected uh, because that means that you have a, uh, the effective barrier for fusion for for capturing of these two zirconium nuclei actually varies with this phase difference and this. Uh, and, uh, and the spread is of the order of 30 MeV. So it's more or less like coming from the Ginzburg-Landau theory. So even after averaging of this effect, because in nuclear physics we have to average over these phases. So even after averaging, even af after averaging, it means that due to this effect, you need more energy for the nuclei, for the nuclei to stay together and this and this quantity and this and this additional energy is of the order of 10 MeV. And it's already something that experimentally can be uh, detected. Uh, how much time do I have? Nine minutes. Okay, so uh, 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 so of course it so these were examples of the head-on collisions of the so the impact parameter was exactly zero. If it is non-zero, like uh, here, then uh, uh, then you can see uh, that depending on the phase difference, these uh, the trajectories, the trajectories of the of the nuclei after a separation may be different because there is different contact time depending on the phase difference. Okay, so let me uh, uh, let me uh, turn to uh, conclusions. So this effect is uh, only due to the pairing field dynamics. So it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, it cannot be uh, uh, described by time-dependent Hartree-Fock or some simplified approaches like time-dependent Hartree-Fock plus BCS, because you really need the uh, dynamics of the pairing field uh, to describe this effect. Uh, so and this is important. Uh, uh <coughs> so the, uh, sup surprisingly, the, the, the energy, uh, uh, the, addition ener the additional energy needed for, for uh, uh, for capture of these two nuclei, it's it's uh, of the order of 10 MeV, and this is something that can be that can be detected. There is also some uh, uh, nucleon current uh, during the collision due to the due to the Josephson effect, but this is not this is not uh, uh, significant contribution. Uh, so now let me. Uh, okay, but this is the optimistic. This is the optimistic picture. Now let me let me uh, let me say something. Uh, uh, add some add a grain of salt. So uh, the open question is the following. Okay, in ultra cold atomic gases, we have a lot of particles. So then we can we can work in the framework where we have a broken particle number symmetry and we can use the phase to describe our pairing fields. But uh, in atomic nuclei, this is a little questionable because atomic nucleus is, uh, has at most like 200 or 300 nucleons. So we should rather use uh, uh, the framework where we have a, where we have a well-defined number of particles. But well-defined number of particles means that we have no well-defined phase. Okay. So now uh, the uh, important question for future studies is uh, how to take into account the fact that uh, uh, and whether this w whether it is important for the description of this effect that uh, we use the framework that has a 
broken particle number symmetry. Okay, the, uh, one of the arguments that I can, uh, that I can give you is that uh, uh, whether we can use this broken symmetry framework or not depends on the time scale of the associated Goldstone modes. So in this case, this, this pairing phase of the, pair of the uh, this phase of the pairing field is rotating in time. Okay, so it has a certain certain period of rotation, and the question is whether this period of rotation is longer or shorter than the time scale related to nuclear collisions. Okay, so when uh, actually when you calculate and when you estimate it, it turns out to be of the same order. Okay, but uh, uh, the crucial point is that what matters here is not a is not the time scale related to the rotation of a single single phase of a of a of a nucleus, but rather what is the angle, what is uh, what is the relative angle of the phase differences between two nuclei. If they rotate exactly in the same way, the angle stays the same in time, and uh, this is the argument, then you don't need to project your wave function on a good particle number. This is the reason why we studied uh, symmetric collisions, so zirconium on zirconium, not zirconium on some other nuclei. Because we wanted this uh, rotation of the phases of the pairing field to be the same in these two systems. Uh, but still it is an open question, so I, I just gave you an argument, but uh, one needs to uh, go beyond and see whether uh, uh, this uh, uh, argument is uh, well founded. Uh, okay, so this is actually everything what I wanted to tell you. Uh, so summarizing, uh, this is some two obvious statements that we use this time-dependent DFT, which is a uh, flexible tool and uh, to study quantum superfluids. And uh, we are interested in these three fields. Uh, in ultra-cold atoms, uh, we are interested in quantum turbulence in Fermi systems and, uh, and also in spin-polarized uh, atomic gases. Especially we would like to study the dynamics of vertices in the presence of, for example, loft phase. And uh, uh, for neutron star, this is... Uh, this is uh, this is a project that we are doing with some astrophysicists that we would like to uh, provide a microscopic input to large scale model of large scale models of neutron stars and especially we are interested in so called glitch phenomenon so uh, <coughs> and in nuclear physics so i told you the applications to nuclear uh, collisions and on friday also aurel will tell you about the application to uh, induced fission. So thank you very much. Okay, we have time for questions.